Hello and welcome to this installment of the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta's webcast series. I'm Sarisha Gunta, Education Director with PB today, PBPA, and today we will be talking about board policies. Why does a nonprofit need them? How do they relate to governance? And which policies are needed for which type of nonprofit? Our speaker today is Janine Bowen, who's not only a partner at Baker Hostetler, but she also has tons of great practical experience serving on major nonprofit boards in and outside of Atlanta. But before Janine gets into the substance of today's presentation, I would like to share a bit about our mission at the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. PBPA provides free business legal services to Atlanta area nonprofits. We connect nonprofits with volunteer attorneys from law firms and corporations. PBPA provides legal insight relevant to small Georgia nonprofits through our nonprofit notes, monthly mailer, and group services such as the Black-led Nonprofit Bootcamp. We also have free resources available on our website and one-on-one -on -one legal counsel to nonprofit clients. On our website, you'll find a host of great resources, including articles, workshops, podcasts, and webcasts, including this one, which will be up next week. If you're interested in learning more about how to become a client of PBPA, you can request uh, fill out a request for legal assistance on our website. And just an FYI, our clients are all 501c3 nonprofit organizations that are located in or serve the greater Atlanta area. And they serve low income or disadvantaged individuals and are otherwise unable to afford legal services. And now a little bit of housekeeping. Keep in mind that the information that Janine will be sharing today is just general information. While Janine will be taking questions today, please keep in mind that her answers and the slides are not legal advice. Please reach out to an attorney directly if you have specific concerns for your organization. And this webcast is copyrighted and I will share the slides for today's presentation in the chat momentarily. And it is also being recorded. So the slides and recording will be made available on our website. And now Janine, I'll pass it on to you. Perfect, so next slide. All right, so here are the three kind of buckets of things we're gonna talk about. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on the fiduciary obligations of the board. I know there's a more substantive and detailed uh, presentation that PBPA presents around these topics, but they're good table setting and good reminders as we move into the discussions around policies and procedures that are necessary for governance. And once we spend some time there, we'll spend a little bit of time at the end talking about the structure of the board to um, effectively implement the policies and procedures. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. So I think it's important for me to kind of establish myself as a reasonable person to be having this conversation with you. And so what this represents is all of the board service that I've been in um, in recent times. Um, you see that I'm actively involved with the Board of Trustees at Georgia State, the Georgia State University Foundation. I was also been on the Clemson University Board of Visitors and the Clemson University Foundation. Um, so I have a lot of educational board experience. Um, but I'm also past chair of the board of directors for Goodwill of North Georgia. Um, and um, that's the largest nonprofit in Georgia, two social enterprise. And additionally, currently I'm a part of the board of directors for the Atlanta Community Food Bank, where I chair the governance committee. So lots of good experience um, to, to lean into today. Um, I encourage you to ask questions as you go and drop those in the chat, and we'll try to cover those off during the conversation if we can. If not, we'll hold them to the end, but I'll try to work them in real time um, as you present them. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's talk about fiduciary responsibilities generally. So a fiduciary is, is derived from the word for trust, and a fiduciary has certain obligations, the duty to act for the benefit of someone or something else, 
Okay. A fiduciary has to show loyalty towards that entity or person to whom that duty is owed. And we have a fiduciary obligation as board members in our capacity as directors for those organizations in which we serve. We have two primary duties. There's there's one or, one or two others, but the two primary duties are the duty of care and the duty of loyalty. Let's go to the next slide. So let's spend a little time on the duty of care. So each director um, must employ um, this duty of care when making decisions or acting on behalf of the organization. It requires that we act like a person in a position let me just read this because it's confusing. Requires that as that we as directors act with the care that a person in a like position would reasonably believe appropriate under similar circumstances. And so that's important. If someone in a like position would say, yeah, that was the right thing to do, then that will fulfill the obligations around a duty of care. And so that reasonable belief in similar circumstances is important. Let's go to the next slide. So let's unpack that. With that duty of care, there are times when we as board members will say, but I didn't know. And because I didn't know, my liability should be excused, eliminated, forgiven. We can pick our word there. But we need to be careful about what we know and what we don't know. So ignorance is not an excuse. Okay, Absence is not an excuse. So I wasn't in the room when the decision was made is, is not an excuse for exercising the duty of care. Oh, I, I wasn't paying attention is not an excuse for the duty of care. Abstaining is not, that inaction, that, that, that the, the comments that I did nothing, right? So how could I, in my role of doing nothing, have, you know, have any liability around a certain situation? That will also not fulfill the duty of care. So that will, that question, those two questions remain. Should you have known and would a person who was reasonably diligent, I mean, if we are asking reasonable questions, would things work out okay? So I like to dwell on this la these last two points because I get very concerned in board meetings when it's too much silence. Because if we aren't leaning in and asking questions, how are we fulfilling this obligation to know what the right things to do are, how to ferret out the risks or the opportunities? So silence to me is problematic and we should be careful when we have a, you know, a room of a dozen or more various skill sets and no one has a question to lean in on a particular situation. We should just be careful that we're being thoughtful in our approach there. So let's go to the next slide. So what did it mean if you did all you reasonably could do and reasonably could not? So the court, doesn't like this backwards look to say, ah, when you're looking hindsight, that was wrong. The court doesn't like to look in the rearview mirror. The court wants to know what you did when you were looking forward into a situation before the resolution occurred to determine whether your decision making was proper or not. So the process used in decision making is very important. That's when we come back to those questions, right? We come back to the diligence. We come back to making sure we understand the underlying issues and the risks and the rewards and the consequences, because that shows that we engaged in a thoughtful process in decision making. And if the decision was wrong, we can still demonstrate a thoughtful process, which leads us to the business judgment rule. Next slide. So the court is giving you every opportunity, okay, to, um, be in good stead, right? So the court's going to give you this presumption that you're acting in a certain way. So the business judgment rule says, and I rely on the court, I'm a lawyer, right? So we're always talking about what the court is going to do in the event that there's some sort of dispute. So the court will assume, applying the business judgment rule, that the board acted on an informed basis. So absent information to the contrary, that the board acted on an informed basis. So I put this parenthetical in because I think it's important. There are certain areas around which no one on the board has expertise or a limited number of people have expertise, okay? In which case, the board may rely on experts, okay? That's absolutely appropriate. Bringing someone else who has the relevant skill set to advise to help the board make an informed decision is absolutely appropriate. And that will result in the court saying that was an informed decision-making process. 
The court will also presume that the board acted in the honest belief that the action was in the best interest of the organization. Okay. And so that means that we're putting on this role of, um, I'm always acting as I'm doing what's best. Now, conflicts of interest will derail this because if I've got a divided mind, okay, then um, you will lose the ability to uh, claim that that presumption applies to the board's activities. Okay. And the, the, the court will also presume that the board acted in good faith, okay, and that the decision making process is substantive. Back to my conversation about asking questions, okay, leaning in, relying on experts, bringing in third parties, digging into issues, right? So they want to see that the decision making was substantive and not a mere rubber stamp, which is why too much silence is a problem, because it indicates that we might be relying too much on the senior leadership team without questioning, not in a controversial manner, but really in a manner to raise the quality of the overall product that the nonprofit is trying to deliver. So that's the business judgment rule. Now let's go to the next slide. So that was the duty of care. Let's switch quickly to the duty of loyalty. So the duty of loyalty requires directors to act in good faith for the benefit of the organization, and decisions or transactions involving conflicts of interest are not protected by the business judgment rule. We'll talk about conflicts of interest later when we review the policies, but these are the criteria around which, uh, what determines what a duty of loyalty is and how it can, be, how can it be derailed. So it requires directors to act in good faith for the benefit of the organization. That should be directors and not directs. I'm sorry, I just saw that typo. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Next slide for me. Okay, so let me sum up. What did I just say? I just said a lot in about 10 minutes here. What did I say? Okay, how do you make sure that you're exercising the duty of care and the duty of loyalty? First of all, show up, okay? Post-COVID, physically be in the room. If, if meetings are live, be there, physically be there. Okay. Now, not only should you physically be there, you should mentally be there. If you are on your phone, as we are want to do, okay, when substantive conversations are there, your body is there, but your mind isn't. And you can't be sure that you're fulfilling your obligations if you're not paying attention. So mental engagement as well as physical engagement is important. And then you need to care about what's happening in the organization. So as board members are, as organizations are looking for board members and as board members are looking for organizations, that notion of the mission of the organization resonating with the board members is important because you need to care about what happens. So if you show up, your body is there, your mind is there, your emotions are there, you're gonna do the right things because you care about what's happening, okay? So pay attention is always important. I know the phone is always buzzing. I, write, I turned off Teams and Teams is still flicking on my, front, my screen right now, right? I'm trying to pay attention. Listen to your spidey sense. So that's the notion, that's that sense in your gut that says, oh, what's happening here doesn't make any sense, right? The spidey sense is danger, danger, you know, Spider-Man, right? Danger, danger. So listen to that. When your spidey sense cuts on, then you need to start asking questions. Then you need to start leaning in. Then you need to get comfort that you are fulfilling those obligations around care and loyalty. So you can demonstrate we engaged in an informed decision-making process. We were thoughtful about how we were approaching these issues. And we saw something that didn't make sense, so we stopped and we dug in. Okay. Dug in meaning we do, dug, we got deep into the issue, not that we became entrenched, right? So listen to your spidey sense. And don't be tricky because conflicts of interest derail all the good work that we just talked about. Okay. If you are at cross minds, on one hand, you're serving the organization. On the other hand, you're benefiting from serving the organization. That's a conflict, and it will negate all the good that's been done. So that's what I just said in those previous couple minutes. Now let's talk about policies, okay? Um, we're going to talk about half a dozen or so. Why are policies necessary? I know that the PBPA has a a model set of policy documents. And I suggest that you work through them, okay, if you do not have anything in place now, because they're essential for maintaining consistency and helping the board achieve its goals. 
the policies are the rules, the policies are the guardrails. The policies make sure that you're operating in ways that are meeting the, obli the fiduciary obligations and operating in the best interest of the organization. Okay? The policies represent the board's voice when the board is not around. So we have to review the policies. The policies are not static in the same way that you review charters of, organ of, of committees to make sure those charters are still valid with respect to the role that the committee is playing on the board. The overall set of policies is also important to be reviewed in some regular um, cadence. Every two, three years, you can be looking back at your policies and making sure that they're up to date. Let's talk about just some of the sample policies. Okay, next page, next slide is fine. Okay, here's some of the sample policies. Now there are many others, right? Okay, many others I could put up here on the slide, but I think these are the big ones. And if you're going to, it's like, I can't handle the universe of things, but I need to make sure I've got the baseline covered. What are they? The obligations of the board of directors. What does every, every individual board member sign up to do? Okay. The bylaws, which really are the rules of the road. Okay. They say how the organization operates. What's the mission of the organization? The conflict of interest policy. If in fact there are conflicts, how do those get elevated to the in the organization to the board and how are they resolved? What actions do we need people to take if there is a conflict? Because a conflict, an, an identified conflict can be resolved. You can put in a plan to deal with that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The financial and auditing policies are always important. Internal controls are super important to the lifeblood of the organization and we'll talk about those. Then we have the code of ethics or code of conduct. How is the board member supposed to behave? And then because social media is such a thing, you know, several years ago, this was not even on the list, but because we understand that viral video and the damage that it can cause when someone is speaking out of turn, then we'll spend a little bit, a little bit of time talking about that as well. Okay, so let's flip the screen. Perfect. The director's commitments. So typically, um, an organization will have a form that the, the director will fill out and sign every year, okay? It's kind of indicating what this director is agreeing to do in their role as um, a board member. And that might include things across multiple dimensions. It could include the committees that the director is agreeing to be in, okay? Um, it will indicate, you know, it will affirm the attendance policy if they're quarterly meetings, Three out of four meetings a year may be the rubric and the board of director may sign up for that, okay? The giving or getting policy, right? What's the financial contribution that's being respected, uh, expected? Uh, is there a give or get? Is it I give the money or do I introduce people to the organization that can facilitate gifts? So the give or give policy is important, okay? Attendance is not only about meetings, but it also may, may be about functions because a nonprofit is engaged in community service and it may be important for board members to be present at certain functions, okay? Or for at least to experience what's happening in the organization to deepen that commitment and that emotional connection to the organization. So attendance at functions may be on that list as well, okay? Um, the, the director's commitments will also include an indication that I have reviewed and signed the code of ethics. I have reviewed and completed the conflicts of interest policy, other items like that. So annually, a board member should be completing and filling out what the commitment that it is make that he or she is making or they are making into the organization. Okay. All right, let's turn the page. Bylaws. So your bylaws is the operating name. Everything that deals with the rules of the road, okay, for the conduct of the organization's business and affairs should be in the bylaws. So what are some of the things that the bylaws should include? Obviously the name of the organization and the purpose of the organization, okay? With respect to board members, right? What's the election cycle? What are the roles? What are the terms of board members and officers? Okay. Term limits are really important, should be exercised to keep the organization fresh and ideas moving through it. So that should be included in the bylaws, okay? Membership considerations, how big is the board? Um, what are the criteria for, criteria for eligibility for becoming a board member? Um, what are the voting rights? Are there different kinds of board members? Is there a board of advisors as well as a, a, fiduciary, a, a fiduciary body? All of that will be set for 
um, in the bylaws, the meeting guidelines, the frequency of the meetings, how often are we getting in the room together? Every other month, quarterly, biannually, whatever it is. And what a quorum is, because if a quorum is not present, you can't do business. So identifying what a quorum is will be important and that will also be in the bylaws. We'll also see things around board structure. So the size of the board, the standing committees, there are any ad hoc committees or the ability to create ad hoc committees will also be there. So indicate, and, and different organizations have different standing committees. So, but the important thing is that they're identified. And if there are um, minimum numbers of participants of each of these committees, that will be important to outline as well. So when you're comp completing your board director commitment form, okay, at some point you have, we have to pair off the committees that are available with the individuals to make sure that each committee is staffed. All of them do not need to be equally um, staffed by board members. The bylaws should also include the indemnification for board members. So the organization should have E&O insurance, right? Directors and officers insurance to protect against third party claims that might arise. So um, any indemnification for board members, if it exists, that should be in the bylaws. The conflicts of interest policy should be referenced. It's either in the bylaws or referenced in the bylaws and executed separately. And discussions about how you amend the bylaws um, should also be there, okay? Again, this is a document that should be reviewed on a regular basis. Every two or three years, we should be taking a look at the bylaws to make sure that they're still current. Okay, next slide. Janine, I'm going to interject briefly regarding bylaws just to make note of the fact that the Nonprofit Code of Georgia was recently amended. And so this would be a very good time for nonprofits to take a look at their bylaws because there are some changes that um, many nonprofits would want to probably consider uh, to make revisions to their bylaws. We have a webcast on that. I'm going to drop a link to that um, in the chat too. So just wanted to point that out, Janine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for highlighting that. And, and I encourage you to uh, to attend that to make sure that you have the right sort of frame of mind for the updates. I see, is there a question in the chat that I need to respond to, Sarisha? I see something just popped up, but not all she There is, um, if you want to touch on it as you go into conflict of interest, um, uh, Scott is asking that I understand board members have to sign a conflict of interest policy annually. Do advisory board members need to sign it as well? So no, because advisory board members do not have a fiduciary obligation to the nonprofit. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that there's an advisory board and a fiduciary board. And those folks in the advisory board are not undertaking fiduciary responsibilities. And so they have no obligation to do so. You may wish to understand. Okay. Um, but in terms of good governance, it's not a requirement. Okay, so let's talk about conflicts of interest a little bit. Um, so this helps to, it's, it's intended to ensure that when an actual or potential conflict arises, the organization has a process in place to deal with what happens with the person and how you resolve the situation. Okay, and then the organization can determine the action plan. So a conflict of interest policy should identify what qualifies as a conflict because everything will not be a conflict, okay? Um, it requires an individual to disclose the potential conflict. And the policy will prohibit those who have a conflict from voting when that matter arises around which the conflict exists. So just abstain from discussions or participation in any discussion around those items. Depending on the nature of the conflict, there may need, may need to be a written management plan um, for the conflicted member's behavior. Um, so what's an example of that? I've had situations where um, a, a spouse of a board member has a business that the board supports, meaning something like, oh, the board buys t-shirts or the, or, I'm sorry, the organization buys t-shirts from company X. And company X is owned by a board member spouse, either partially or wholly, totally, right? So that conflict of interest form, that board member should elevate, okay? Organizations doing business with XYZ t-shirt company. My spouse is a partial owner of that business. What do we do? 
And so then the organization can go through the diligence process to determine what course of action, if any, is required to deal with that. It could be something as simple as saying, the board does not have any ability to affect who we buy t-shirts from, and but we're going to codify in any event, if anything comes up with respect to t-shirt purchases, okay, that this board member is going to abstain from that conversation altogether. They will not be in the room when we have those conversations. That's an example of an action plan. Okay. Um, so this just ensures that a board member is not sitting in the room, listening to items, that they have a vested interest in the outcome or the decision that's made. Okay. Um, so annually, this conflict of interest policy should be circulated and the form should be completed. And the organization should have diligence around this process. It's, it's often interesting to get board members to complete this form but the organization needs to be diligent to do it. So somebody needs to be the hound to make sure that sucker is signed, okay, that is completed and signed. It's particularly important. Okay, now, so much of what I said around those fiduciary duties dealt with conflicts of interest. And I treated it shortly here, but this is the meat of it, just elevating things where the organization and the individual are not aligned. Okay, because they actually, the individual actually has an interest in the outcome. Um, and once you clarify or, or clear the conflict, then all of those rights, the business judgment rule applies. You can operate with a duty of care. You can operate with a duty of loyalty. And the court will presume that you have acted in a way that's in the best interest of the organization as opposed to a personal best interest. Okay, let's go to the next one. Financial and audit. Okay. So this is clarifying the roles and responsibilities around financial management activities and decisions. Okay. The financial and audit policies and procedures also should establish internal control structures. And the audit function, there may be a separate committee for audit, or maybe the financial committee handles the audits as well, ensures that audits are undertaken to protect, protect, protect the tax exempt status of an organization. So what are some examples of financial or audit-based policies? cash management, travel expenses, internal controls, a CEO compensation philosophy to make sure that you keep the rebuttable, rebuttable presumption in terms of the compensation that the CEO receives, gift acceptance policies, accounting procedures, audit requirements. Okay. Now your annual audit will pick up things okay, that are where controls are lacking. And then it's the responsibility of the finance committee or the audit committee, depending, to go back and clean those things up. But for sure, all these policies, so there's a financial policy, but then there's lots of procedures that are that are um, operational in nature that need to be implemented. I'll give you an example when there's a, we've I've seen an audit or um, internal control miss. Um, an organization that I previously was um, have affiliated with had projected for that fiscal year that it was going to run a deficit. That was known to the board. The board did interest it, signed off on it. Every meeting, we're having discussions about how we're tracking against the budget, okay, how we're tracking against that deficit. And so we know that where we are based on where we anticipate it being. We get to the end of the fiscal year and we learn that the organization had twice the deficit that it projected. Now this could be catastrophic to the organization. It could just wipe the organization out, okay? Now in this case, it did not do that, but we asked, it's like, where were the internal controls to catch this? Because you told us as board members, as the board, that we were gonna run a deficit. We accepted that when we signed off on the budget. We just said, okay, we understand why, okay? We tracked it. If the finance committee tracked it off cycle, the board tracked it during the meetings. How do we get to the end of the fiscal year and we're 2x what we expected? Their internal control issues. Okay, so we have to go back and start working on the internal controls. So those are examples where you, an example where a problem arises and then you got to go back and make sure that the internal control, control structure is tight. Now, if you are a part of a nonprofit that has, um, a reserve or an investment fund, so monies that are set aside and not a part of the budget to deal with catastrophic situations that may arise, 
then you may have an investment committee, right? In which case you'll have investment policies and procedures um, if you're going to have a reserve. So you know how to treat that reserve when you can go into it, when you can't go into it. So you'll need role, rules and regulations around the treatment of any reserves. Let's go to the next one. The code of ethics, a code of conduct. So this is a set of principles or values that guides the organization and its people. Um, and it can be called either a code of ethics or a code of conduct. It's just personal preference. Some organizations really just set forth guiding principles. So the values of the organization of the organization okay, are listed, and that's the code of conduct or code of ethics. I like to be a little more thorough than that high-level statement of here's what we value. Okay. Because clearly I think here's what we value should be part of it, but there's more to be said here. So what some what are some other things that need to be said? Um, the organization or the director should agree that they're going to comply with applicable law. You should say that out loud, okay? Um, that there's going to be a desire to refrain from dishonest conduct or dishonest behavior. That there's an obligation to use good judgment, an obligation to avoid conflicts, an obligation to respect the board structure, which is really important, okay? And respect the roles and, and responsibilities that each person plays. Because a board needs to respect the role, between the, the, uh, the relationship between the chair and the executive. Okay. And certainly, um, it, we should codify that the structure of the board, the committee's ability to make decisions, and those decisions to be respected at the full committee, at the full board level, vetted but respected is important, okay? Because you don't need to set up a structure where you have committees, but really it's committee at the whole because no one listens to the diligent work that is coming out of the committees. Um, you should respect the, clarify the responsibilities of the board versus the responsibilities of the leadership and CEO. The board is not operational, okay? The board is strategic. The board is policy driven. The board is not operational. And so clarifying those responsibilities is important. Now, in smaller nonprofits, it may be that the CEO or the senior leadership team relies on some of the expertise of the board members. And in fact, those board members were chosen because of that expertise. Understand that relying on or, or, or um, getting using someone's expertise is absolutely appropriate, but that person as a board member does not run the organization, the CEO or the executive director and their leadership team run the organization. So clarifying the responsibilities between the board and the senior leadership team and the CEO are important. Managing confidentiality appropriately is something that should be discussed in the code of ethics or code of conduct. Managing gifts given to board members. Is it appropriate for a board member to receive a gift? Is it appropriate and, and how do we deal with that? It may be a non-issue. You may need to talk, think about it deeply depending on the nature of the nonprofit. Communications to the public should be dealt with as well as stewardship of funds. So that's just kind of a list of things that we should be concerned about in the code of ethics and code of conduct. And this document as well should be executed annually. So everyone is aware going in, here's my refresher. Okay, on um, how how I am expected to behave as a board member of this nonprofit. So I'll be clear. Okay, so let's talk about social media. So social media policy outlines the goals, rules, roles, and best practices for using social media on behalf of the nonprofit because it can protect you from organizational reputational risks, legal issues, can build positive brand. Lots of good things happen if social media is used properly. Lots of bad things happen if it's not, okay? And so there's two pieces to social media. There is the way the organization uses social media um, for the benefit of the organization. There, and there's the way individual employees and board members use social media. And you'll need to discuss both of those in the policies. So how can social media go wrong? Employees or volunteers say bad things about the organization. Saying bad things now always includes video. It always includes video, right? Okay. And that's just a bad place to be in. Customers, stakeholders, and constituents say bad things. Employees, board members, volunteers disclose proprietary information. 
that's a bad thing. Okay. So what do we need to consider? Who shares organ um who shares on behalf of the organization? So it should be clear that there's certain things that the organization says and is solely responsible for the content. That if there's an inquiry to a board member, board member knows I refer that inquiry to the CEO because it's not for me from a social media perspective or any other media perspective to weigh in on it. Organizations should clarify what that media presence is and the social media policy should conform to that, okay? It's important to understand that we have to be careful not to blur the lines between work behavior and personal behavior. And so board members have to think about this, okay? I sit on boards and there are things that are happening in my Facebook feed, in my Instagram feed. I'm not an X user anymore, but on X or on threads or pick your, click your platform, okay? That I personally have a reaction to. I have to be careful as a board member what I respond to publicly. Because if that goes awry, then I assure you, not only is it Janine Anthony Bowen who's getting called out, it's her employer, it's places where she volunteers, it's places where she's a board leader, because the desire will be to destroy me and everything in my food chain. Okay, the same for you. So you have to be careful as a board member what you're putting into the ecosystem because it never goes away. This does not mean that you can't have personal perspectives that you share into in social media, but you do have to realize the consequences of the choices of the sharing. So, um, and especially it's like, but what I talked about has nothing to do with a nonprofit form of board member. Irrelevant, right? We know stories where somebody went to a drive-through and said something bad to the people, the drive-through workers. Next thing you know, he gets fired. Every organization he's affiliated with gets these things happen. So we just need to be very cognizant that the, there's a blurring of lines between work behavior and personal behavior. And as board members and as employees of the nonprofit, our actions can inure to the benefit or the detriment of the organization. So it's important to know. Okay. Also, social media policy should include how we deal with employee stuff. Okay. Um, and maybe that's in the handbook. Okay. But for sure, you know, the notion of how employee grievances are handled, it should be clear that an employee should know if you're mad at, in my, at, your, comp, at your employer, don't go to social media to vet that dispute, to vet that grievance, okay? But there should be a policy um, or some sort of rigor in place organizationally to deal with employee grievance handling. You also have to figure out when you want, you know, employees to put or uh, board members to use the logo and to try to further the brand of the organization. When it's important to use photos and what's the role of photos, what's the role of video. But because this can be such a benefit or such a detriment to the organization, details around social media are important. Now, let's talk a little bit about committee structures, okay? And how the committee structures help effectuate some of these board policies. Janine, I wanted to say something real quick um, when you mentioned the grievance policies yes. for employees and social media. Um, I want to bring up two other briefly policies too, one of them being the whistleblower policy, which kind of ties into the grievances that you mentioned. Um, and I also want to mention a document retention policy. And the reason why I'm specifically mentioning those two is because um, on the IRS form 990, for, the, for those organizations that are large enough to have to fill that out. Um, the IRS specifically asks about those two documents and whether or not the nonprofit has those policies. So when the IRS is specifically asking about it, um, they ask about conflict of interest, whistleblower, and document retention. Um, then, then an organization might want to also consider having those um, because the IRS wants you to have it. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. I'll be embellishing my deck with those points next time. Okay. Um, all right. So those are less sexy, but now very important, right? Okay. And so that's the, that's the takeaway there. So let's talk a little about committees. So committee structures are going to help implement um, or effectuate some of the policies we've talked about. So let's go to the next slide. 
So these are the typical com typical committees. These aren't all of them, but these are the typical committees. Okay. Um, so there's certain things you can't do organizationally if there's no committee structure in place to put those projects into for completion. So the executive committee and, and committees are the bylaws will indicate who serves on these committees. So for example, executive committee could be chair, vice chair, secretary, treasurer, if that's the list of officers. Executive committee could also include the chairs of the various committees, okay? It can do, it can have whatever structure um, we desire, but that's generally the leadership committee. And that committee in the bylaws generally can um, operate on behalf of the board when the board is not in session. So the executive committee can make decisions as if it were the full board, okay, um, when situations arise that require that level of engagement. Sometimes it's things like um, the organization may have gotten a grant and the board has to affirm that it approves the grant. It's an off cycle. So instead of doing off meeting cycle, so instead of doing um, an email vote, um, the executive committee can affirm um, the award of that grant uh, because on behalf of the full board. So that's an executive a time when executive committee can operate outside of, um, but for the benefit of the full board. Now, nominating governance um, is, could be two committees, could be one, okay depending on the organization. So nominating is the committee that keeps the lifeblood of the organization of the board alive, right? And this is a very important committee because this is the one that says, we have term limits. Our term limits are, I'll just pick one out of the hat, which is not, which is not unusual, uh, two, three year terms. And so at the end of the first term, we're gonna make sure that the board member is, and there should be a process to make sure the board member has kind of fulfilled their obligations in the prior term, okay, and we're going to re-nominate that board member for a second term. Nominating committee could say, we're about to engage in a capital campaign. We need some people that are better suited around financial, um, around development and around foundations, around corporate giving, et cetera. So we need to increase our sophistication in that regard. So we want to go find someone who does that. Um, we need to have some CPAs. We need to have some lawyers. We might need to have, a nominating committee may say, we might need to have someone who sits on the board that has received or benefited from our services. Nominating committee will be charged there. So that organization is responsible, that committee is responsible for the lifeblood of the board. Um, interestingly, um, I was at a, a Feeding America conference through my Atlanta Community Food Bank um, board earlier this year. And there was a lot of discussion about making sure that there was a diverse board. And I serve on boards where we have taken that very seriously across multiple dimensions, around gender, around race, around ethnicity, around LGBTQ, around, around all the aspects, including those we serve, okay? Around geography. Um, and so if you wanna have a diverse board, you really need to pay attention to it. It doesn't happen just automatically. And so we had someone in the room is like, well, I'd really like to increase the diversity in my board. How did you do that, Janine, on boards you've been on? I says, well, I sent the charge as the chair to the nominating committee. And that person said, we don't have a nominating committee. Then there's no way for you to do it, right? I, I don't know how you get members, okay? Are we just picking friends, right? Are we, what, what are we doing? So that notion of paying attention to who is coming onto the board to complete that skills matrix and identify the skills and talents and capabilities that the CEO and the senior leadership team would like to look to the board to supplement and raise the bar on the expertise of the organization that comes through nominating. Now, governance deals with all the policies and procedures and charters, okay? And so all of the things that we've talked about previously, governance can facilitate all of those conversations, okay? Um, but all of this is a governance activity. I personally believe that anything that's not picked up by all these other committees is picked up by governance because I like to just do meaty work and you can do a lot of meaty work in the governance committee and that can really drive the success of the organization. Obviously you need a finance committee and the CFO or the um, organizational financial leader is works closely with the chair of the finance committee to make sure that everything is okay from a financial perspective. Budgets are being completed. Um, we're looking at P&Ls, we're looking at operating statements. 
So the finance committee is charged with that. So you will need some financial expertise. Somebody on the finance committee needs to have financial expertise, right? Someone on the audit committee needs to have audit expertise. I've gotten pretty good at being on audit committees because I have a friend that's a, a partner at KPMG and I had just learned from him everywhere I went, not taking him on boards everywhere I went. So I've learned how to be a good audit committee member. Okay, but that's because I leaned into financial experts. So you'll need that expertise. If also, if you have an investment committee or you have an operating reserve, you need to know understand how to manage that to maximize the, the uh, abilities or the uh, maximize the, the, the benefit of having reserve funds set aside, um, then absolutely you'll want someone with investment type experience that can give the organization some direction because that's unlikely to be a core competency of anyone on the leadership team of the nonprofit. Every nonprofit is, is concerned about development, okay? Um, that's board giving, that's individual giving, that's foundation giving, that's corporate giving. And so the board needs to be concerned about the development and marketing activities that are taking place in the organization. So there's always um, a development committee. And so if there's a chief development officer or some other development leader, that person works closely with the chair of the development committee to facilitate um, a lot of the work that the board may need to do from that perspective. Also, depending on the size of the nonprofit, okay, there may be a compensation committee that might be delegated to the executive committee. But the, so the, the CEO, the only employee that the board has is the CEO. That's the only person that reports to the board, it's the CEO, okay? So CEO's compensation is driven by the board. Um, and so you might need to have a compensation committee to deal with hiring that person. That, that committee turns into the CEO search committee when um, there is a CEO search that needs to be undertaken. But certainly the compensation decisions around bonuses, um, increases in pay, um, adjustments around compensation studies need to be undertaken. And either the that's a separate committee or that might be delegated to the executive committee from time to time. So those are some of the typical committees. Um, there may be other committees that you know, are important based on the nature of the organization. Um, there's no mention here of a committee that is focused on the mission of the organization. And depending on the mission, you might need a mission committee um, to help facilitate the mission of the organization. Um, but these are kind of the core ones that you'll see generally. So I think that is all the slides that I have. Um, I see some questions in chat and some questions in Q&A. Virginia just asked, because I just see it right here, is the nominating governance committee the same as the board development committee? Yes. So board development and nominating equal each other. Um, they serve the same role. Okay. You can have a nominating and governance committee that are separate depending on the robustness of the nominating process, but it's not unusual for them to be one committee, but that is the board development committee. Okay. Sarishi, any other questions in the chat that we can respond to? Um, we do have some questions in the Q&A, Janine. Okay. Um, uh, one of them from Amy. What are best practices regarding non-board members serving on committees? Ah. Are there certain committees that should be only board members? It's a great question. It is a great question. Um, you have to be very careful about non-committee members sitting on, non-board members sitting on committees. Generally, when you have a certain skill set that you need on that committee and that skill set does not exist on the board, there may be an opportunity for you to go to find someone to serve as a non-board committee member. Understand that person does not have a fiduciary obligation to the organization, but certainly can lean into the issues that the committee is facing. Okay, That person can have a vote on the committee. Potentially, the charter or the bylaws would give some um, guidance there organizationally, but certainly that person can come in and be a part of the conversations to aid in the decision-making, certainly, okay. It's not unusual as well for that person to be kind of a pipeline person. It's like, oh, we'd like to really see how this person works and whether we'd like to ask this person to be on our board. And so there may be an opportunity to learn about um, the ability for that person to operate as a full board member through that committee role, um, but be careful because they do not have fiduciary responsibility to the organization. I've seen it done 
when we just need a specific skill set that doesn't otherwise exist, um, then we might go out and find that person as a one on a one off basis. And Janine, we have a question about kind of miscellaneous uh, roles, like, for example, what committee would technology fall under, or is it recommended to outsource this? So I have, I'm seeing more and more technology committees, right? Because people are concerned about IT, they're concerned about implementing new systems in the organization, they're concerned about cybersecurity attacks. Um, and so a technology committee is becoming more common, um, but I don't see it a lot, right? So that can be an offshoot. It depends on who owns the technology function in the organization. If the CFO's office is also the office of the CIO or the chief technology leader, then all of the issues around technology would come through the finance committee. And you might need to have a subcommittee to deal with finance um, with technology issues under that committee. If that's where the leadership of IT really sits. Okay. Um, you could have a strategic planning or strategic initiatives committee if there's certain IT or technology related issues that are driving mission or driving success. So you could have a separate committee um, around strategy or technology if you had a specific reason to do so. Um, so I've seen it both ways, technology committees. I've seen subcommittees of existing committees just to deal with those issues with a smaller group of people. Um, and then I've seen it at the strategy level where organizations are undertaking digital transformation. And so they need a whole committee to kind of think through the issues with the the chief information officer or other technology leaders in the business. I hope that was responsive. I think it was. <laughs> um, another question about um, bylaws. If the bylaws state specifically that something is the responsibility of the board, for example, hiring and firing the CEO, mm -hmm. is that something that the executive committee could take action on? on behalf of the full board? So um, so there's certain things you may wish to not delegate to the executive committee, right? I would not delegate the hiring and firing of the CEO to the executive committee. I think that is a board level activity. Um, the, comp the CEO search or compensation committee can, should, can deal with the evaluations and assessing all those things if there's not a, if, if that committee is separate, but if it sits at the executive committee level, I would not um, outsource that responsibility to a committee. I would leave it at the full board level. But for a CEO search, you need a separate committee that is working on those issues and they're gonna bring back the candidates to the full board, full board for a final vetting and um, approval. And another question about, um kind of enacting the policies. Do the policies need to be signed off on by the board of directors? How do they become policies? <laughs> so there's a there's a policy manual, right? Okay. And so yes, the board of directors should affirm the policies. Okay. Some of them are board level policies. And if they're not board level policies, they shouldn't be in this book anyway. If they're operational documents, then the CEO is going to have discretion there. But we're talking about board level policies and the board should acknowledge, should approve them. Okay. And acknowledge receiving them when new board members come online. And another question that um, came up in our kind of like pre-registration, which I thought was an interesting question. Um, how can non-discrimination policies help or hurt with board diversity? Oh, that's a thought question. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're in a very interesting era, er, era around diversity or how you implement organizations to have uh, a diverse population. Um, so I think the board has to determine what's important to it from um, what makes it complete, right? And if there's certain non skill set based criteria, it's fine to consider those as a matter of what's complete for that organization. A lot of organizations will say, we would like our board to reflect the people that we serve. 
And that's going to drive a certain set of decisions around what the board looks like. Is nothing wrong with it. There's there's nothing wrong with that at all around saying that. Okay. Um, so I think it's a really tricky question. Um, but I remain committed to the idea that organizations are better when people are not monolithic. And the organization has to determine what monolithic looks like and how you reject that as the um ongoing state of play organizationally. But it's a tricky question and I'm not rendering legal advice because it's a tricky question. Yeah. yeah. And definitely and right now there's no straightforward answer for there's that. No straightforward answer. Um another question about uh non-board members serving on committees or subcommittees. Mm -hmm. Um are there certain documents you would recommend being obtained as they set up the subcommittee? I'm not sure I understand the question. So are there certain documents you would recommend being obtained or a file being set up for subcommittee members like board members? And I think they're referring to if you have a subcommittee that includes individuals who are not, not who are non-board board. members. Okay. Okay. Um, so first of all, a subcommittee should have a charter just like a full committee, right? Because you need to understand what the charge of the committee is. So regardless of the subset or full, it should have a, a charter. Um, I think that you give access. Now, I'm assuming that we aren't talking about tools that are otherwise only accessible to board members, right? So certainly that non-board member committee member should have access to all the documentation that is relevant for that committee's functioning. Um, if for some reason those differ between um if there's a subset that should only be available to the board, then I think you keep those from that individual. But for the most part, if you're bringing a non-board member into a committee structure, you're giving that board member full access to the documents relative or relevant for that committee or subcommittee. And if you implement that from an infrastructure perspective with a separate file share or a separate Teams channel or a Dropbox, okay, whatever infrastructure you like to use is fine. But certainly that person should have full visibility for purposes of fulfilling their obligations on the committee. And I'm going to close out with one last question here. What are some good resources for new board members on, hold on, scrolling here, on getting familiar with their responsibilities? Um, mm -hmm. I would say start off with this webcast because Janine has provided a great baseline of information for both new and existing board members, people who have probably served in the role mm -hmm. for years. This is a really great refresher, Janine. Yeah, so thank you for that. And also there's plenty of tools online. Um, there are plenty of websites that are devoted to um, speaking to the nonprofit community and board leaders. So Blue Avocado is one that just comes to my mind. There's the Center for Nonprofits. There are tons of organizations Tons. There are several organizations, if you just do a web search on nonprofit board members' rights and obligations or responsibilities, okay, things will pop up for you um, that'll be a treasure trove of information. As a matter of fact, some of the details I pulled here, I was like, oh, I need to refresh myself. So I went to some of those resources myself, okay, to make sure that I was giving you the latest and greatest information. Um, so I don't have a, a, a list in mind, but there are, I even came up with you know, YouTube videos popped up in, in the search. So certainly um, there are, you know, a handful of very high quality organizations that are serving the nonprofit board community that you can tap into to learn more. And um, and I'll give a shout out to PBPA's website too on that. So, um, but those are all the questions that we have so far. Janine, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. It has been my pleasure. And to the nonprofits who have tuned in, if you're interested in keeping up with PBPA, please sign up for our newsletter. And our next webcast will be in January in 2024. And we'll be talking about um, going global considerations to keep in mind if you're looking to take your nonprofit's mission overseas. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Take care.